can do things like sponsor, help sponsor this, the family of uh, uh, Candlelight Night that's coming up May 5th. Hopefully you'll all get a chance to come to that. That's really a fun, fun time, especially for kids. There's lots to do there. We also help out, uh, we volunteer to help out work projects that uh, sneak the reserve and, and to get the word out around town about the reserve. What a great place to do. We're always looking for new members. On the back table, there's some brochures explaining about the Friends Group and a tablet if you want to sign up and uh, would like to join. We're always looking for new members. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Ariel Christian, who is a senior here. She's uh, going to UWSP, comes from Lake Tomahawk, and she's going to tell us all about Crows, mysterious, mischievous, Malicious, don't <laughs> know. Ariel Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to begin by reading your story. It's called The Rainbow Crow, and it's actually um, a Lenape Native American legend. And it's retold um, by Nancy Van Land. Long ago, before the two-legged walked the earth, the weather was always warm and the animals were always happy. But one day, something happened and caused the earth to grow cold. Tiny crystals, glittering like diamonds, drifted down from the sky, covering earth with a sparkling softness. The animals seeing snow for the first time were not afraid. But soon the snow deepened and Mouse disappeared. The tip of his tail were all, was all the animals could see, and they began to worry. Then Rabbit disappeared. The tips of his ears were all the animals could see, and they worried more. At last they gathered together in a clearing, deep inside the forest to talk about the weather. What was needed, they decided, was a messenger to travel at once to the great sky spirit and ask him to stop the snow. But who would be willing to leave Earth to visit the distant place where the sky spirit dwelled? Possum said, Owl is the wisest. Perhaps he should go. But no, the animals whisper. He might get lost in the light of day. Owl should not go. Then Beaver said, Perhaps Raccoon should go. But no, he might follow his tail instead of his nose. So Raccoon should not go. Then Skunk said, Perhaps Coyote should go. But no, the animals shouted. Coyote is clever and loves to play tricks. He might chase the clouds or swallow the wind. Coyote should not go. Scritch a scratch a screech a scratch a yip a yip a yoo ya yo. The noisy animals screeched and howled because they could not decide who should visit the great sky spirit to ask him to stop the snow. And soon the snow grew deeper and deeper and deeper, and the small animals climbed on top of the tall animals so they didn't disappear. Suddenly, down from the top of the tallest tree flew Rainbow Crow, the most beautiful bird on earth, who called out to all the animals below in the sweetest voice of all birds. And he sang, so I will go, I will stop the snow. And the animals, happy at last to have Crow as their messenger, chanted the song of praise. Then high up in the sky flew Rainbow Crow, far above the snow and the winds of the earth, way beyond the moon, the stars, and the clouds. For three days, Crow flew until he came upon the giant sky spirit, who was too busy to notice. So Rainbow Crow began to sing. The great spirit stopped to listen. Never before had he heard such a sweet voice sing such a beautiful song, and he told Crow to choose a gift. Now Crow knew that far below on Earth, the snow was getting so deep that soon all the animals would disappear. So he asked the great spirit to stop the snow. Spirit replied, no, Crow, I cannot stop the snow, for snow has a spirit of its own. When Snow Spirit leaves the clouds to visit with his friend Wind Spirit, the snow will stop, but Earth will still be cold. So Crow asked the Great Spirit to stop the cold. The Spirit replied, no, Crow, I cannot stop the cold. All I can do is give you the gift of fire. Fire will keep you warm, and it will melt the snow, so that your friends will be content until warm weather returns. The Great Spirit picked up a stick Put a bit of fire on it, on the end of it, and handed it to Crow. I will give you this gift for you once. Hurry, fly back to Earth before the fire disappears. And off flew Crow. 
On the first day, his crow flew, showering sparks of fire darkening his feathers. On the second day, as Crow flew down, the fire burned brighter and his stick grew shorter, and all of Crow's feathers were covered with soot. On the third day, as Crow flew down, the fire was so hot and his stick was so, so short that smoke and ash blew into the Crow's mouth. His voice became cracked and hoarse. And when at last Crow returned to the clearing in the forest, all the animals had disappeared. Only the tops of the tallest trees could be seen the branches sprouting through the deep snow. So Crow flew down, close to the pale, pale ground, around and around, until the fire melted the snow, and his friends were safe. And this tiny stick of fire became the grandmother of all fires. And for all the animals on Earth, and all the animals on Earth thanked Crow. They danced and chanted a song of praise. At last Crow, all alone, flew off to a distant tree where he wept. He was no longer beautiful. He could no longer sing a sweet song. His rainbow feathers were gone forever. <coughs> and when Snow Spirit emptied the clouds and joined Wind Spirit, the snow stopped. The crow still wept. The great sky spirit heard Crow and came down from the sky. And when he saw Crow, he said, Soon the two legged will appear on earth. He will take the fire and be master of all. Like now. For being brave and unselfish, I give you the gift of freedom. The two-legged will never hunt you, for your meat will taste like fire and smoke. The two-legged will never capture you, for your beautiful voice is now crackly and hoarse. The two-legged will never want your feathers, because your rainbow colors are not black. But your black feathers will shine, and they will reflect all of the colors on earth. If you look closely, you will see. Then Crow looked, and he saw hundreds of tiny rainbows shining in his black feathers. And he was content. The great spirit returned to his home in the distant sky, and Crow happily returned to his friends in the forest, proud that he was now Black Crow, with shining feathers full of tiny rainbows. So that's our lesson. Thank you. So, as you know, I'm Ariel, and I am a senior at UW Stevens Point, and this program here is a part of my um, senior capstone course, if you will. And I'll be giving you another one next month. Yeah. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for coming out. So my program is all about crows. So we're going to dive in deep and learn the secret about crows. And hopefully by the, by the end, you can call yourselves bird brains. Because a bird brain is a compliment to crow's life. Because they're very well known for their intelligence. And so we're going to talk about how their intelligence influences their communication their relationships, and their diet. So I want you all to imagine that you are inside of a cake. You're inside of a shell. It's dark, and it's nice and warm. And you've been in that egg for 18 days. And you hear the distant call of your mother and father. And you're ready to break open that shell and see the world. You're ready to break open your shell and say hello to your mother and father, crows. So once your shell is broken, you are a tiny, helpless little chick. You are blind, and you weigh about a half an ounce. And just to get some perspective, a slice of bread is about an ounce. So you pretty much weigh a half a slice of bread. So you're going to be in your nest for about 30 days. And after 30 days, you're going to be a fledgling. And this is what you would look like as a fledgling. Kind of weird, right? It doesn't really look like a crow. Well, a lot of people um, think that they're completely helpless because they can't fly. Usually, fledglings can't fly for a couple of days. But don't worry, um, you're going to be all right because your parents know exactly where um, you are going to be safe. So they're going to watch out for you until you can fly. And they're going to help you with every step. So for the first year of your life, it's crucial that you follow your parents. You are their shadow, and you mimic them. Does anybody here have older siblings? When you are really young, or right now, do you act like them, or want to dress like them, or be like them? 
Well, I did. When I was really young, I wanted to be just like my brother and sister because they're so cool, right? They're older. They're so cool. I want to be just like them. So an example of this is um, Jimmy Fallon's late night show. Um, <laughs> comedian Will Ferrell, he looks a lot like Chad Smith, the drummer from <laughs> Red Hot Chili Peppers. But when they dress alike, they look like twins, don't they? <laughs> so Will Ferrell wanted to mimic Chad Smith, and he tried to drum, and it didn't go so well. <laughs> So crows do this too. Mimicry is extremely important for crows because that's how they learn. They learn through observation. And it's because of those relationships that they have with each other why it's so important um, in terms of their intelligence. So we know the very beginnings of your crow life. Let's dive a little bit deeper and talk about their relationships and what is important in those relationships. So the first year of your life is crucial. But what's really interesting about crows is that they stay with their parents for up to four years. Because they actually help their parents raise their new siblings. That's pretty cool. So there was this study done that um, a man named John Marsloff, he was a wildlife biologist in Seattle, Washington. And he did this study to figure out the importance of their relationships and how they pass that information to their kids. So he captured a couple of crows on campus, and but he did this while wearing this mask, this kind of creepy caveman mask. And he banded them and took their measurements wearing this mask, and he released them. And as he walked through campus wearing this mask, the crows would scold him, and sometimes they would even die bomb at his head. <laughs> they recognized that face because he would walk by wearing a different mask or not a mask at all, and the birds would do nothing. Even better yet, he came back five years later, and the kids of those crows scolded him as well. And they were never captured. So that information was passed down from generation to generation. So that just um, helps to prove that relationships for crows are really important. So the family unit is extremely important. And I want to show you this. Um, with yarn. Now these strands of yarn are tied together with a knot. And that knot represents that tight family unit. Um, the shorter strands are going to be the mom and the dad. And they stay together their entire lives. Crows meet for life. How lovely. And then the long strands are the kids. So what I would like to do is pass out some of these, well, all of these, not everybody's going to get one. And then I'll tell you um, what we can do with them. where their territory is, 
and hang out in a cornfield with other crows from other families. And they get to learn, observe, and talk with others. And they might meet someone. Who might they meet? Their mate, their lover, their crow lover. <laughs> so, to represent that, I would like you to tie your long strands to a neighboring um, crow family. So, the blue one, I'd like you to tie the blue one to a different orange one from a different family. And then your orange one from a different family. Can we see all right? Sure that you're fine. You're fine. You're okay. Oh! oh. Square enough. Oh, oh, my God. Good. Good. Um, 
right outside Schmeekly today. I hear them almost every single day. So the American crow, and that's, um, they're around most of the country. And there's also the fish crow, which is found on the eastern seaboard. And then we have the hooded crow, which can be found in eastern Europe and Russia. And then has that, those gray feathers. And there's also the jungle crow. This one looks quite a bit different, because look at that bill, it's huge. And that you can find in East Asia. And then we have the pied crow, which is in Africa. That has that white instead of the gray. So there's crows all over the world, and some of them look different, and some of them look very similar. There's also a European crow that looks just like the American crow. And sometimes these crows, if they occur in the same countries, they may hybridize with each other. So then it'd be difficult to figure out what kind of crow they actually are. So crows are all part of the family Corvidae. Now corvids are known for their intelligence, because they have very big brains relative to their body size bigger than parrots. So um, we have other family members of the Corvidae family, such as ravens. Now ravens and crows are very similar looking. Ravens are quite a bit bigger, um, and they have a more angle to um, their wings, I guess. They have that angle here, and their wingspan, and their tail is a little bit more angled than the crow. The crow has a more rounded tail and straighter wings. Also, ravens had a little bit of a crest on their head, and I just think they're a little bit more shaggier, too. Their feathers are. Um, the crow is more sleek. Now, did anybody notice on the brochure or the poster that it was actually a raven? Did anybody <laughs> notice that? <laughs> oh, you all failed. <laughs> it was a test, <laughs> and you failed. Um, so, yeah, that's couple differences about um, ravens and crows, and they have different communication, um, but we won't really go into that today. Um, and another member of the Corvidae family is the blue jay, which we see in Wisconsin all year long. So now we're going to talk a little bit spe more specifically about um, crow communication. So I'm going to play a couple of calls for you, and if you really think you have what it takes, Please mimic them. <laughs> I think I think you can do it. I think you can do it. So we're gonna listen to it, and then we're all gonna mimic, and then we'll talk about it a little bit, right? Higher pitch. Higher pitch? Definitely. Anything else? 
shorter, faster? Shorter, faster, definitely. It is more like a sharper um, call. Piercing. It is, yeah, for sure. This is actually the warning call. And it does sound pretty similar to the companion call, but it is more sharp. And to me, it sounds like a warning. Now, why do you think they would want to warn each other? Yeah. Maybe because there's a predator nearby. There's a predator nearby. Yeah, like a hawk or an owl. Or even a human, like John Marswalk wearing that mask. They definitely made that call when he was walking by. And sometimes these warning calls also mean, come here, help me. I'm in danger. And a lot of times crows will all come together from a complete um, community and try to ward off danger together. And that um, usually, or not usually, but sometimes can turn into a mob of crows, which is what this is. A lot of crows trying to scare off something dangerous. Do we want to be mob, a mob of crows? <laughs> Stay far away from you guys, for sure. <laughs> so I'm going to play one more call, and I'd like you to share, um, or just think about, um, what it sounds like. It's very unique. Hmm. What the heck? A bird is making that noise. What does it sound like to you? Oh, look at the dolphin. A dolphin? <laughs> He's actually like, coming from his, his throat. That's actually, it kind of sounds like a rattle, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's called the rattle or the comb call. And a lot of um, biologists still don't know why they make this call. Sometimes they make it before they're feeding, or when there's danger, or it can even be a mating call. So maybe it's the different inflection in their voice um, that um, has a different meaning. So there's so much still that we don't know about crows' communication. And they actually make over 20 different calls. And they make those in different sequences to mean different things. Um, so we've only hit the tip of the iceberg when it comes to their complicated communication. So now that we know a little bit more about that, let's talk more in depth about their diet and what their diet has to do with their intelligence. Crows are opportunistic eaters. They eat pretty much anything that they can find. They eat seeds. They eat nuts, berries, fruits, worms, um, fish, small mammals. They eat other birds. They eat other birds' eggs. And yes, they eat trash. Because a lot of people know them as the trash birds. They eat trash? They do eat trash. Gross. <laughs> they do eat trash. But if they live in a city, that might be all they have um, to eat. Because they occur on every continent except Antarctica and pretty much any habitat. So they find a way to eat almost anything. And that has, is a major reason why they're so intelligent. Because um, it forces them to figure out how to eat those different things. And they're kind of like us, aren't they? We eat so many different kinds of foods and we've figured out how to eat those foods. Yeah, we've cultivated plants, and crows haven't done that, but they problem solve and figure out how to eat a lot of different kinds of food. So this is a walnut. We have black walnut trees here in Wisconsin. How might you crack open that walnut without a tool? <laughs> without a nutcracker, without a hammer. Probably drop it from one high. Exactly. That's exactly what crows do. And if it doesn't crack right away, a lot of times crows will drop this in a road, knowing that a car is going to drive it and crack it open. But they're not going to swoop down right away and grab it. No, they're going to wait until it turns red so they don't get run over by a car. They, they sit there and observe and make sure all the cars have stopped and they swoop down true? and grab their tree. It is true. Wow. Yes. Just wait, you're going to find out some more cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. never find a so that's just the very beginning of how crows problem okay. solve with different things. So there is a crow being studied 
um, called the New Caledonian Pearl. And New Caledonia is this little island on the east side of Australia, and a specific crow named Betty is being studied at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And she is being put to the test, and she does certain um, problem-solving um, techniques to get to certain foods. And they've actually found that a lot of these crows, and even crows around the other parts of the world, are doing these things in the wild. So they're pretty amazing. So to demonstrate some of these things, I would love a volunteer. Not everybody at once. Oh, nice. Please, come up. If you think you can be a bird brain. <laughs> okay, so what I have here is some food, not really food, sorry, in a little basket. And it is in here. And just pretend it's a cow. And you want to try to reach that, but this is your beak. You can't reach down in there. So you've got to figure out how you might pull that basket up with that wire. Oh. You can do whatever you'd like to that, to that wire. This is your beak. 
So if you can't grab it, you might want to get it to a better place. been known to do, especially Betty, the New Caledonian crow I mentioned, she can do an eight-step process um, of untying a stick and moving something else to, for a different contraption and getting to that food. So she was able to sit and look at the situation and figure out what she needed to do first, second, third, fourth, and so on. So pretty amazing. A lot of mammals cannot do that, let alone some humans. <laughs> so, <laughs> crows will also do some crazy things to get food. A lot of times crows will mob together, yes, to ward off danger, but they also mob together to get food. So a crow, a whole crow family might mob a certain animal that has caught a meal, like a river otter, for example, is fishing, and crows will mob that river otter until they drop that fish so they can steal the fish. Kind of mean, right? But kind of smart. Um, crows can also mob things that they want to eat. Like, um, crows have been known to mob rabbits into the road knowing that a car is coming. They'll run over that rabbit and they'll eat the rabbit. Yeah, pretty amazing stuff. I don't think I could do that. I don't think I would ever think of that. So, they're very intelligent um, because of their diet. They're kind of forced to um, problem solve with, with each thing that they eat. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit more um, about their intelligence. And I'm going to share some more stories um, about crow intelligence. So get ready, because they're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> crows are spies. They spy on each other. Because crows will hide their food from each other. And crows are known to steal their food from um, their neighbors or even their family members. It's kind of mean, right? A lot of animals do hide their food. Um, but crows are also able to be aware that another crow is spying on them. So they fake hide their food. <laughs> what? <laughs> Can I actually get two volunteers? I like <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So you, you have the food, okay? This is your food. You can hide it. And you can put, you can put them all in one, underneath one cup or a bunch of the different cups, whatever you would like. But your friend is spying on you. And so you are the spy, and you want to try to figure out what cup he's hiding from under, or what cups. So if you want to go somewhere and try to hide and Make sure that you can figure out what cups he's hiding them under. Whatever you want. Yeah. But try to be sneaky because he's going to spy on you. And you know he's spying. <laughs> 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 Do you think you know where it is? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she just wants to have fun. 
sound a call and they're gone. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Tried a lot of different ways. <laughs> they spot you. Yeah, they do. But they'll, let you get, they'll let you get a little close, you know, but then there's a zone and then that's it. They feel yep. threatened apparently. Mm -hmm. More yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. I tested out the face recognition factor. Oh really? <laughs> cool. I read about it online because we had a ton of crows on our property. And so instead of killing them, as this gentleman alluded to, <laughs> I decided to take my James Bond Sniper Ruger 177 pellet gun and scare them. So I made sure that when they came into my property last summer that they saw my face. And I would point my pistol so they would see my face. And then I would shoot, and I'm very good shot, right below where they were sitting. And then they would give off the ah, 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 ah. And I did that repeatedly for weeks. And now they land on the neighbor's property. <laughs> very, very smart. They know my face, because when I come home, and they happen to be there, getting our garbage or trying to do whatever. You know, they see neighbors. me and they run. That's really cool. Though. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, did I see a hand over here? Yeah, I would probably eat that. <laughs> Any other stories? I know a woman whose next door neighbor had a pet crow, and to her dismay, the crow would always take steal the clothes after she 
hang her clothes. <laughs> She hated that. <laughs> <laughs> Would you play with them or just? I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, they're so funny. Yeah. I witnessed a, a crow parent that had already raised its uh, clippings, so they should have been able to take care of themselves. And the, the crow actually, if, the, if it, uh, I guess their body language, the crow looked like it was irritated. So it went to a hosta plant. And it ripped off part of the leaf and it threw it at the juvenile and <laughs> walked away. <laughs> <laughs> I have a <laughs> 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 Thank you for sharing your stories. I love hearing them. And if you have more, I'd love to hear them after the program, too. Um, so there are a lot of negative views on crows. Especially things that we see in the movies, right? A lot of times crows are associated with death. And like cemeteries, somebody dies, there's a crow right up in the tree. And in some cultures, they've been seen as um, a symbol of death. But different movies that we see, like The Birds <laughs> by Alfred Hitchcock in the 60s. And it wasn't just crows, but there was multiple scenes in the movie where um, a giant mob of crows is attacking people. Kind of scary. And that's a real fear for some people, too. Um, but actually, a group of crows is literally called a murder of crows. Yeah. So that's pretty negative, too, isn't it? Um, and also scarecrows. People have made scarecrows to scare crows away from their fields. Especially in places southeast, where they roost in those large numbers. Um, they've actually damaged lots of crop fields just by eating the crops. But a lot, in a lot of Native American cultures, birds and other corvids, like ravens, are known for their intelligence, for their big brains. And like our story in the beginning, remember Rainbow Crow? Rainbow Crow is known for fearlessness, and courage, and even magic. And in Chinese um, mythology, there's a three-legged crow um, that's a symbol of fire and sun. And a lot of Native American tribes have crow clans. They've honored the crow because of their intelligence. So a lot in this country, um, crows have been known for their courage and their intelligence. And people, um, modern day, will actually raise crows um, that you've mentioned. And um, my father, actually, when he was a teenager, he climbed up a tree knowing that a crow's nest was there, and he stole a nestling from the nest. And he raised the crow, and it sat on his shoulder, and he would feed it. It would fly off during the day and then come back to him. And um, it, was, it was pretty cool. But that crow is a wild animal, so don't do that. Don't do what my father did. Because that crow deserves to be with his family. He deserves to have those... Um, relationships with his crow family and communicate and learn from his his true family in the wild. So some people will raise crows if they can't survive in the wild, if maybe they've broken a wing. Like this example I'm going to show you. This lady um, raised this crow and actually taught him how to speak and his name is Jiminy Crow. Did you talk to How are you, buddy? How are you? How are you? Oh, I'm good. Hey, what's up? What's up with you? What's up? What's up? What's up? Hey, you tell me what's up? What's up? What's up? It's cold outside, right? I know, right? It's cold out. I know. I know, right? I know. You have a bad cough. You have a bad cough. You being so cold. Oh, dear, I have a cough. You have a cough? I still am amazed by that, that a crow can learn how to speak. But parrots learn how to speak, right? They're wild animals. So, yeah, that just is another reason, or another thing that proves how incredibly intelligent they are. 
so <laughs> crows are so intelligent, and because of their intelligence, they are able to have those complex relationships that kind of are like our own relationships in our own family trees. And just the way that they communicate with each other, these complex um, calls and ways of communicating. And their diet, their extremely diverse diet, and their opportunistic feeding habits is another reason um, why they're so intelligent. So um, crows and humans have been um, living together for hundreds of years, right? Crows have been observing humans for a long, long time. Have they been learning from us? Because they learn through observation, have they been mimicking things that we do? And humans have only begun to start watching crows. <coughs> so I think we have a lot to learn from crows. They are extremely intelligent, as some of these stories have told. And, and I encourage you and I challenge you the next time you see a crow, just observe it. Just listen to it. Is it making that companion call or is there danger? And just observe it. And I hope that you get inspired, as inspired as I do, or maybe annoyed. <laughs> but then you can figure out a way how to get rid of them, right? <laughs> just by understanding them more. So thank you so much for um, coming to my program. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I'll try to answer them the best I can. Do they only eat dead animals? Or do they actually swoop down like catch a mouse or something? Or? They might, but usually it's already dead because they steal a lot of dead animals from other animals. But they do sometimes um, chase things. Actually, um, in the spring when songbirds are migrating back, crows will um, chase them knowing that they're exhausted from migration. So they do that. I don't know if they would hunt, actually hunt down. <coughs> so, yeah. Can they go on water or can they swim? Yeah. I don't think so. I've never seen a pro swim. I don't think they would do so well in the water. Did you have a question? Yeah. Are there hunting regulations on crows, and um, is there regulation of those on keeping them as pets? That I am not sure. The hunting part, I wonder if that would be on the DMR? They're actually not protected. No. They're not protected species. Okay. There is a hunting season on it per se. They're not edible, really. That's the problem. Why would you want to eat somebody who's garbage? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about keeping it as a pet. Though. I'm sure there are regulations. I'm not sure about if I'm Yeah. How far will a crow travel? You were talking about how they meet a mate and they could go across state, across the country. Do you have any idea how far they actually would fly? That I'm not really sure. Because a lot of crows um, around this area, they overwinter. So they might not travel very far. Um, but other crows might travel farther. I'm not really sure about that. Okay. But they do, they are known to migrate. But not like other birds. Okay. Would a crow eat another dead crow? Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> American crow as a pet because it's still a native species, um, but you can keep starlings because they're not protected, but you can buy uh, a non-native crow such as the African pied crow. I've looked it up because I really want a crow, um, but they go for like uh, 3500 starting, so they're really expensive. Wow. So, just so you know. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Where do the uh, crows build their nest in a tree? Yeah, they prefer pine trees. Yeah, they hide them really well. And as soon as the um, chicks fled the nest, they abandon the nest. They only use it for their eggs. Would you care to share how you became so passionate about crows? I don't know. I've just heard them calling every single day. And honestly, I did this program to learn more about them. Okay. Yeah, and just hearing my dad's cool story about them. <laughs> the crow he had. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's a typical lifespan? In the wild, at most 15 years, but there was actually a crow, um, a captive crow in New York that was 59 years old. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, I feel like that's very rare. 
but maybe about 10 years in the world. Yeah. Any other questions? Can they teach each other, like two adults teach each other? Oh, I'm sure. And during those big roosts out east, um, normally the crows don't mingle with their immediate family. They, they meet and mix with other crow families. So they probably learn and talk to other crows from other places. Kind of like humans. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciated you all coming out tonight.